may we all stand, if you are able, uh, for the call to worship. God calls to, uh, to the lo lost, the, the least, and all who long for home. God will find us and lead us safely home to faithfulness. Let us celebrate and rejoice in God's presence forever. God calls and welcomes us back to worship this day. Let us worship God together. Amen. May we pray. Loving God, we're so happy to be here this day with open hearts and open minds to hear your message and to learn and to grow. Thank you for this wonderful congregation, for this church, for all of us who work so hard to keep things going. Thank you, God, for the blessings of this day. In your holy name we pray, amen. God of love, God who finds us in our brokenness, hear our prayer. We gather to worship you, the source of light and love, grace and forgiveness, creation and its creatures. Every good gift, every child, every bite of food, and every breath we breathe, we owe to the one who called us into being. That is to say, we owe it all to you. So we give thanks to you. Enjoy, God of love, the songs we sing. 
Hear the prayers that we speak and teach us your wisdom as we listen for your word. But God, though there is a lot to be grateful for, we must confess not everything is right in the world. Some of us are sick, heart sick, sick in mind, sick in body. So for those of us who are in need of healing, God of peace, make it so. Or if not, give us the strength to endure the trials we face, the pain and the struggle. May your peace find us even in the valley, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Please be with those of this body of Christ who are not well. We pray for Janet Casey Allen's mother, Elsie Allen, as she is sick and overseas. We pray for Sandra Anderson and her son Doug. We pray for George Record, for Alice Langford, for Francis Stone, for Ed Philby, and many others. Not only are things not right with us, there is a lot that is not right in the world. God of peace, violence is prevalent. Hearts are hard and seem repulsed by sacrificial love. Our country and our world is divided by tongue, tribe, religion, and political leanings. Your children are at war with one another in many ways. Cain kills Abel over and over. And our children are being shaped by the struggle. God, help us to see ourselves in each other. And your light in the eyes of even our enemies. Keep us from becoming consumed with the hatred and fear that we claim to abhor. God, fill this congregation with your spirit so that we may catch a vision of who we may become in you. Give us the faith of Abraham that he found when he had the courage to step out in faith and uncertainty into a land that he did not yet know. Give us hope and a vision, a vision cast by you in your wisdom and knowledge of things that we cannot yet see. Give us new eyes to see the world aright. Give us the eyes to see each person as beloved by you who knows them best. Open our eyes to the suffering of our friends and neighbors so we can become as water in a dry place, a saving hand, an embrace of love, a light in the midst of darkness. Give us the grace to forgive and to live out of the love you have revealed to us by your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in that name that we pray. Amen. Now join in the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. This story needs a bit of context. This is one of three parables that Jesus told in response to some questions that he was being asked regarding his decision to eat dinner to break bread with sinners and tax collectors. You may remember some weeks ago we talked about the significance of sitting with sinners and tax collectors, how this was something that ought not to have been done if Jesus uh, was on the up and up. And so he has asked some questions. And this parable is one of three told in response to those questions. Or what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents." As I said, this is a parable that was told to answer the accusations 
being made at Jesus, accusations that suggested that he should not be eating with the sorts of people that he was eating with. And he immediately after that told a parable of lost sheep. You may remember from two weeks ago, we talked about what it might mean to stray. But there are some differences between this parable and that parable. Uh, one I just alluded to, sheep stray. We talked about how we, like sheep, sometimes are so busy munching on grass and meandering about. We look up and all of a sudden, life's journey has taken one turn and then another and we are, or we feel, very lost. And we may not have seen it coming, but being sheep, we had some volition, some choice in the matter. Not so with a coin. A coin is inert. It has no will. It is cast aside, it is pocketed, it is, in the parable, found, and no credit to the coin. And so one theological point I want to make that I'm not going to form my sermon around uh, is involves this implication. What it might mean to be like this coin, unable to find ourselves, hapless, and yet God finds us, that is grace that is very one-sided. And it implies that there are those who God is seeking who may not know it. It implies that there are those who are going to be found one way or another, even when they were hardly looking to be found. But there's another notable difference that I would like to point out, and it's that the God character in the parable is a woman. This is one of four parables where the main character in the parable is a woman. And I've been in conversations where I've pointed out how the language used in some biblical passages, especially in the wisdom literature, is gendered feminine, implying that God has feminine characteristics too, as well as male. And that doesn't carry very far for some people they say okay fine it's implied in the language so what here is a story where Jesus has a very clear God metaphor and it is a woman searching for a coin so if you need a, a one of the red letter verses to be convinced if Jesus was comfortable with this comparison then we should be So, now to the parable. The woman loses a coin. How much is the coin worth? Well, it depends. Now, I know that this coin was something called a drachma, which the commentaries say was worth one day's wages in that time. And for someone, perhaps like this woman, we don't really know her social standing, but the fact that she searches so hard implies that to this woman, this coin is very valuable. But you can imagine someone losing a coin worth one day's wages for a common laborer and shrugging, walking on, kind of like when you walk past a penny or a nickel or a dime or even these days a quarter if it's maybe underneath a car or someplace where you'd have to get down and reach. Not really worth your time. It all depends on your perspective and your relation to the coin, the value that you place in it, and it can change depending on who you are. The question is, the person who sees this coin is worth not very much, does he or she see it right? Or does this woman know something about the coin that maybe we don't know? Now, of course, this story about losing something and searching frantically for it is very relatable. I wrote in my sermon on Wednesday that one of my frustrations is found in losing my keys, which you could not know that this morning Kelly called me and told me that I had lost the keys again, but I was here. So she's looking for the place that I placed the keys. And that is a very frustrating thing. You have the kids packed up. Abel is in his little seat. Josie is toddling out towards the van. I have made, not Josie, June is toddling out towards the van. Josie, being six, big girl now, I make her carry some things and 
polar own weight. And then I realize I don't have the keys. So I've got to get the kids in some sort of safe place where I can search for the keys. You know how this goes. Long story short, uh, this morning the keys were in my fall jacket pocket which is the place that you stop lurking, say, in about May, when you don't need a fall jacket pocket anymore. So come the end of winter, that'll be the first place that we look when we lose the keys. And then forget again come spring. At least once every two years, it seems, Kelly loses her engagement in wedding rings. And we spend the first half of the day assuring ourselves that it will certainly turn up. Mary and Eric are smiling because when they visited about three months ago, that's exactly what happened. We spent two days looking for those those two rings. Um, Long story short, they were in the couch, the place we searched about four times before we found them. But about once every month, our daughter Josie loses Bear Bear. Bear Bear is a small white bear, stuffed animal, that she cannot fall asleep unless she knows exactly where it is and where it had better be is tucked underneath her chin. This is Bear Bear. She got Bear Bear in the mail from her Nana. If I call Nana Grandma, she gets upset. Half tempted to say she got this from Grandma, Nana, we'll say Nana, and she's not going to watch it anyway. Um, And this was a a dollar gift that she bought to send her something on Valentine's Day, used to be holding a little heart. How much exactly is this worth to you, to me? Not much. Very frustrating to go looking for this bit of cloth and stuffing. It's kind of dingy. Smells all right. It was cleaned recently. Which we do often when she can't find it right as she is turning in for bed. It can be very frustrating. Usually we flip over a few blankets and there it is. It kind of falls onto the cushion or into the middle of the bed. The worst is when she knocks on our door at three in the morning because she has woken up to discover that in her sleep and toss and turning, she has lost Bear Bear. And sometimes the search for Bear Bear goes on for 20 minutes, which is an eternity at three in the morning. Kelly asked if I wanted Josie in here to talk about this. I said no. Because most of the time, this thing is not only a source of frustration, to me, it's hardly worth the cloth that it's made of. Don't tell Josie. (laughs) But my doorway, entrance into where I wanted to go with this sermon came from my reflections on a dime that I noticed whilst using the bathroom in a grocery store. In the corner, not a very clean bathroom, grime. And I didn't even have to ask myself the question as to why I did not pick up that lost coin. It's filthy. And somehow I intuited that it wasn't worth as much as the 10 cent numeric value that we ascribe to dimes. But as I really thought about it, I realized that no, a dime is a dime is a dime. It's always a dime. It's a dime whether it is dirty in the corner of a bathroom floor. It's a dime should it be shiny clean, minted in 2018, and in my pocket. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to resurrect the dime and find the worth that was always there. And so I picked it up. I've washed my hands since then. And I cleaned it. I scrubbed it. And I made it shiny again. Before I did that, I was reminded of 
the sinners and tax collectors that we've been talking about and how oftentimes our unwillingness to pursue them or to find them is our perception of them. They're like that dime that if we really, really stop and think about it and if someone were to pin us down, we'd say, yeah, it's still worth what it always was, but, but those folks, those people, oh, yeah, I guess they're made in the image of God, but they're so tarnished by their life's experiences and their choices. I'm reminded of the woman caught in adultery, one of the best Jesus stories, where they were ready to stamp out her existence because it was believed that she had negated her worth by her choices. We all have people like this, people that we view like this. Some of us, in our worst moments, have viewed ourselves like this. Jesus had a different perspective. The whole point of this parable, remember, is to remind us of the worth of the coin that that woman knew was there. Whether others could see it or not. So when I look for my keys, for example, someone might say, those are just little pieces of metal that if you melted them down, you know, you might get a, 20 cents for them at some scrap dealer, probably not even that. But to me, they mean transportation. They mean the entrance into the home where the people I love the most live. They're even the keys to the church, which is the place that I worship. Little pieces of metal mean more to me. Or my wife's engagement ring. Now there is actually something that is of value in a commodity culture. I spent an entire summer working in a factory that made clutch plates and the entirety of my summer's earnings save gas and Red Bull that I drank because it was the night shift, third shift. I would buy sugary drinks. The entirety of that was spent on that ring. I worked in front of machines that had shot out parts into the ceiling I thought if I were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I worked around ovens where I bonded parts together and sweat through several shirts. It means something to us, but I could see perhaps someone like one of the Kardashians looking at that ring and going, ew. Just saying. The value and worth has to do with your perspective. Now, I am biased, and so I actually think that my wife sees the ring most clearly and that her vision of it tells me more about its worth than perhaps a reality television star. Then there's this, I'll say, darn bear. Where my daughter, if, this, if I left this here in the church when we, when we were done and I lock up, and if we discover at 9.30 tonight it is here instead of at home, I will have to drive here to get it. Because my daughter sees something in this that I don't see. Now who sees it truly is purely subjective. But you can kind of see how it might be for one person to see something and to see value and another person to see no value at all. Now, that dime that I found in the bathroom has a longer story. I discovered that it was worth at least 10 cents and I put it in my pocket. And Josie was with me. We left the bathroom and on the way out, she noticed what she noticed coming in, which was the gumball machine, where the gumballs cost exactly one dime. And so I took that previously worthless coin, now worth 10 cents, and I put it into the slot. Oh, actually, no. If I put it in the slot, she cries. She put it in the slot because she loves the process. And in doing so, gave it 
a four-year-old's blessing, she was four at the time, helped her turn it, gumball comes out, she pops it into her mouth, and for about five minutes, she knew more joy than I can remember feeling in a long time. Which is not to say I don't feel joy, but it is to say that sometimes children can feel it on the deepest levels. What was that dime worth then? It's hard to put a price on something that has now become a cherished memory and something that I wouldn't take money to forget. Now, as far as our woman searching for that coin, it's God searching for people. I hope we can all agree that the worth should be self-evident. So this is a sermon and a parable for two kinds of people. Jesus was directing it at the folks who had a problem with him sitting with tax collectors and sinners. And we have each been that person. You and I have a type of person who kind of... What words do we use in our mind when we think about them that we may not say out loud because we don't want to offend the people around us or we want to come across as a humane and kind person? We each have a kind of person who triggers us. And this parable calls us to remember that the love of God is such that the value that seems hidden is always there and is always true and is worth seeking out. And it's a call for us, church folk, and everyone else besides, to begin participating in the transformative work of finding those on purpose, scouring the house, turning it over till morning's light, and then some, and finding them however we can, which means we must always remember the worth that appears to be buried by the muck in the mire, that when you polish the dirty dime, its worth is rediscovered, never lost, rediscovered. But it's also possible to imagine the people sitting around the table, the tax collectors and the sinners of whom the parable is about. And maybe they have absorbed the labels and the impressions and the feelings and the dismissiveness of the crowd that are questioning Jesus. Maybe they have taken those and have allowed those words and those actions those postures, to change the ways that they think about themselves. Maybe they have, along with their culture, devalued themselves in their own eyes and have even thought that maybe the way they see themselves is the way that God sees them. As a pastor, I run into people all the time who feel that they are so damaged that they are beyond recovery. They believe that the image of God in which they are made is tarnished beyond repair and they are thus unworthy of love. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of religious people to cast stones at these and ignore those who feel they are about as worthy as a dirty dime. And if that's you, I'll remind you, God sees you through and through. Lot of the, one of the things that we must remember when considering these parables is they are meant to reflect an accurate portrayal of who you are. And if they are accurate portrayals of who you are because of how God sees you, then at this point you are arguing with the one who knows you best about who you are. God says, you are worthy of love and I will find you one way or another. And we say, oh God, you couldn't possibly know. Didn't they tell you? Didn't they tell you? Haven't I told you enough who I really am? I think we would do well 
to believe the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. The God who knows you are worth saving has sought you since you were born. And she isn't about to stop anytime soon. It doesn't matter what you've done. There is enough grace for you and then some. So stand or stay seated. But either way, feel your worth. Be made clean by the grace and love of Jesus and you will begin to know yourself. The beauty and love that lay hidden will shine through and you will see yourself as you are. We've all been like that dirty dime, but the value was always there and it still is. So keys are found and I am relieved because now I am on my way. Engagement rings are found and the bride calls her mom because she is so relieved that she has found what was most precious to her. Little stuffed bear is found probably between the wall and the bed or worse in the corner behind the bedpost where I've got to almost crawl under the bed to find it. But when it is placed back in the arms of my now six-year-old, she knows that the world is a beautiful place and that she is loved and that she is safe. A dirty dime is picked up and the one who found it discovered that it was worth more than he ever knew. A woman finds her coin. God finds the sinner. God finds you. And all the heavens go absolutely wild for the joy of finding one who was always worthy even whilst they were lost. This is an open table, so if you are here this morning and are our guest, then this meal is for you as well, and we encourage you to join with us in communion. We do this because on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he passed it to his disciples, saying, this is my body which is being broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out to his disciples saying, this is my cup of the covenant, my blood which is being shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we take of the bread or drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he returns. Loving and forgiving God, we come around this table today with grateful hearts filled with love and compassion and hope. We thank you for the gift of this bread, for the gift that reminds us of your life given for us. And we thank you for all the generosity of your people and of your heart. And we thank you. Amen. Gracious God, around this table, we experience your love, your embraceive love, as in no other place. And around this table, we hear the calling of Jesus our Lord, calling us to be a presence in the world in which we live. So give us your sense of our calling. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
please take, drink the cup of our salvation. One of the, way, the ways that we tell this story is by living out the characters. By being the people in the parables that seek and that find, that catch a piece of God's heart and allow it to grow inside of them. And then it is not one story we are telling, the story of Jesus and Jesus' seeking and finding of us, but one story after another of seeking and finding and sons coming home to redemption, of lives transformed by the love of God, hundreds of stories, thousands of stories that we will tell with our hands and feet and hearts and actions when we leave this place. How many stories will we become a part of? How many of our lives will get woven into parables that inspire and transform and motivate others to create transformative stories of their own? Leave here and be as that woman. Seek the lost. And if you have been lost, know that you are loved more than you know. Go with God and have a good week.